it is good to be with you again this morning, and good to see everybody here, although it is so weird. Uh, right after the lesson or right uh, before we close today uh, the one on the website that we have available to us is not the one that we know so what we did we actually took an image from our songbook and I start I was worried about the copyright and noticed that it was from the year 1790 something so we're okay there everything's good so it just uh, it's laid out a little bit different from what we're accustomed to thought I'd let you know that now uh, as we've been doing lately, we're starting this morning with God's plan of salvation. God sent his son as a sacrifice. He died in our place after having lived a perfect life. And we respond to that by obeying the gospel, believing the word of God, turning away from sin, confessing Jesus as being the son of God. And then we allow ourselves to be buried with him in baptism, in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And at that point, we're born into the family of God and the Christian life begins. And once again, well, we have several examples today, starting with Noah. Uh, Noah is a young man from the church up in Spencer, Wisconsin. Uh, Noah was baptized by his dad, Dan. Uh, Noah's mom, Rhonda, is one of our counselors every summer at Beaver Creek Bible Camp. We actually stayed at Dan's house many years ago, back when he was single. Uh, I went up to Marshfield to preach, and we stayed at Dan's house about 20 years ago. Dan was very hospitable. He owns his own outdoor furniture company and also serves as a deacon at the church up there. And so we're just really happy along with Noah and that whole family uh, this uh, past week. And then we also have some recent baptisms due to the good influence of the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Uh, some of you who were here a few months ago may remember that Mark Teske came up here as a guest preacher. And he explained that program and the good things that they're doing. So we're thankful for those who've been baptized over the past few weeks due to their good influence. And again, we're sharing these images by way of example. What these people have done over the last few weeks, you can do this morning if you have not already done so. And so uh, if you have any questions, if you can think of a reason why you should not be baptized, I'm curious to hear that. And I'd love to talk with you later today. If you're watching the live stream, our contact information hopefully is on the screen. Uh, if you're joining us on the phone, the church number is 608-224-0274, and you can either call or text me at that number. This morning, I want to invite you to be turning with me to Isaiah chapter 9. And so if you have a Bible with you, Isaiah chapter 9 is where we'll be studying this morning. And in Isaiah chapter 9, we have what is basically a birth announcement, a birth announcement. We know that parents these days will often send out cards or pictures or will usually today post something online on social media and many of these are very creative if you've seen some of these uh, some are rather impressive but what all of these announcements have in common is that each announcement is always made after the child is born birth announcements obviously are not sent out before the child is born so that is something that all birth announcements have in common today though we are looking at an announcement that is made more than 700 years before the fact. That makes it extremely unique. It's also unique because the child is given four names. And as we study, hopefully it'll be rather obvious that these four names refer to the coming of Jesus. The announcement comes through the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah is bringing some encouraging words to God's people for the far distant future. Immediately after these words are first written, life will be very difficult for God's people. But in the opening verses of Isaiah 9, Isaiah says there is a time coming when the northern tribes, that is the area where Jesus will eventually grow up, these tribes, once treated with contempt, once in gloom and anguish, once walking in darkness, there's a time coming when they will see a great light and they will rejoice with great uh, gladness and they will actually break the yoke of the oppressor. And there was certainly an oppressor at the door at the time Isaiah first wrote these words. So this brings us to Isaiah chapter 9. This morning, let's look at verses 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So this morning in the time we have left, I want us to focus briefly on the names that are given to this future king at the end of verse 6. And what is especially strange is that these names describe what the child will do. Normally, we don't name our children based on what they will do in life. And the reason is they aren't doing anything when they're born. We have no clue what they'll end up doing. But here, this is very strange because the names describe what the child will eventually do. The birth announcement is rather strange. And so in the time that we have left, let's look at the four names that are given here. And I want us to start with the name or the description, Wonderful Counselor. And today, obviously, what do we think of? when we hear somebody refer to a counselor. Most of us probably think of a therapist of some kind, a specialist in the mental health field, somebody we go to to help us work through some difficult time in life, and that's certainly a part of it. But in the ancient world, this term often refers to an advisor of some kind, often an advisor to a king, somebody who gives advice to a government leader. Just a few days ago, I was studying for this lesson and had the news just kind of playing in the background, kind of filling the dead air. And I heard Kellyanne Conway described as the counselor to the president. And it's right as I'm studying this verse about a counselor. And I thought that was interesting. And, and so in that sense, she's not a mental health therapist, is she? Uh, but she is giving advice to somebody. And that's kind of the idea of a counselor in this context. Um, so Jesus, unlike world leaders, does not get advice from people. But he is the wonderful counselor, and so he is the giver of advice. He is not uh, somebody who gets advice, he is the advisor. He's personally described as being a wonderful counselor. Since we just finished studying Genesis 3, I should point out that Eve first got in trouble when she listened to bad advice. Do you remember that? Satan was there to advise her on the choice that he wanted her to make, and so she listened to bad advice from a bad counselor. But Jesus, though, is a wonderful counselor. As far as I can tell, the word wonder, by the way, is always used in Scripture to refer to something that God has done. And I thought that was interesting. Out of all the times that word wonder or wonderful is used, it, it refers to somebody who is supernaturally wise or something like that. As we just studied a few weeks ago in our Wednesday class in Luke 4.22, the Bible says that all were speaking well of Jesus and wondering at the gracious words that were falling from his lips. And so people were amazed by the counsel that the Lord was giving. And that certainly fits in with the name that Isaiah predicts that he will have. What we really need to notice here is that Jesus is not just any counselor. He is our counselor. He is our wonderful counselor. He is approachable. He always understands exactly what we're going through. As scripture explains in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so as our counselor, as our advisor, Jesus knows what it means to be tempted. He knows what it means to be betrayed by a friend. He knows what it means to be tired and hungry and afraid. He knows what it means to be homeless. He knows what it means to lose a close friend to death. And so no matter what we go through, it seems that Jesus has already been there. He's experienced it. He knows something about it. With all of this in mind, then, I would encourage all of us to make an appointment this week to sit down for a discussion with the wonderful counselor. He is always available. He's eager to hear from us. We come to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. We tell him what we're struggling with. We dump it on the Lord. And then we patiently listen for ways that we can apply his word to our situation. As we go back to the text, we also find that this future king is also described as mighty God. That's a rather heavy title for a baby, isn't it? It's a birth announcement. Mighty God will be his name. Some translations might refer to a hero God, which is an interesting translation, or a warrior God. 
He is miraculously strong and powerful. And yet we look at the birth of Jesus and it was the farthest thing from a powerful birth type experience, anything but mighty. No room at the inn, placed in a feeding trough upon his birth, born into a, a poor family, raised as a carpenter, nothing to indicate any supernatural strength. And yet we know that as the Lord grows up, he calms the sea, he feeds thousands, cast out demons, gives sight to the blind, heals the sick, raises the dead. All of these things start happening. So Almighty God came to this earth in the form of a seemingly helpless child. And yet he was not helpless, was he? A few years after Isaiah writes these words, the prophet Daniel will prophesy that this child to be born will be given dominion, glory, and a kingdom and that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And then also, as Paul explains in Philippians 2, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. So yes, he came to this earth as a baby, but he also came as mighty God. And so when this life is hard, when we face things, we go to him for help. When we struggle, he's mighty. And when he's weak, uh, when we are weak, he is strong. And this brings us to eternal father. And certainly we understand that Jesus is not the father. There is a distinction between the father and the son. And yet we also think of that passage in Hebrews 2 where we have Jesus referring to the children whom God has given to me. So there is a sense in which we are the children of Jesus. He, in a sense, is a father to us. We might also think of the Apostle Paul who wrote to the church in Thessalonica and he said, you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. And so there was a sense that Paul was a father to the people there in Thessalonica in that he cared for them and he protected them and he was concerned about them and so on. And so uh, the same is said of Jesus in Revelation 11 or Re Revelation 7, for the Lamb of God in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's a very fatherly thing to do. And so in a sense, Jesus is our father. We are like the children of the Lord, and he is our eternal father in this passage. Of course, as we think about our own fathers, we realize that they are not eternal, are they? Our fathers pass away. And so it is not an eternal father that we have here on this earth. They're only with us for a few years at the most. We also realize that not all fathers are good. There are some bad fathers in this world. Jesus, though, is our eternal father, and he is a good father. He's our protector. He is our provider. He looks out for us. A number of years ago, I remember one of our members describing his daughter taking the city bus to get to school for the very first time. And as a, a father here in Madison, that absolutely terrified me to see my little girl getting on the bus to go to school and all that. And I was terrified as a dad, but this particular father, as I remember him telling it, watched his daughter get on the bus. And then he got in the car and followed the bus and made sure to keep an eye on her in that way. And I can't remember if the girl knew this at the time that her dad was tagging along behind, but that's what dads do, isn't it? They watch and they guard and they protect and they support and they provide. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. He is our eternal father. So let's close today with the Lord Jesus being described now as the Prince of Peace. Today, obviously, when we hear the word Prince, it has some baggage with it. And many times we usually think of a future king, a little boy maybe, uh, perhaps who might be a real king someday, uh, Prince Charles. I don't know if that day is ever coming, uh, but somebody like Prince Charles or William or now little George. And, you know, that's the, the picture that comes to our mind, at least with me when I first hear the word prince. But that's not really the word that Isaiah uses here. It's not limited in that way to a future king. The word that we have here translated as prince in English is sometimes translated as chieftain, chief, ruler, official, captain, prince, leader, 
officer, overseer, governor, or commander. Those are all ways that we could legitimately translate this word out of Hebrew into English. And so the idea is Jesus is a leader. He is a ruler. He's a captain who will bring peace. And the peace he brings, obviously, is not the absence of war. This world has been at war almost constantly over the past 2,000 years since the Lord arrived on this earth. And so the peace in this passage refers to completeness or soundness or welfare, a state of being, a solid or healthy relationship. And so we might say then that Jesus came to establish peace between us and God. We sinned. We created a break in that relationship, but Jesus came to make things right. Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question for us is, are we at peace with God right now? Are things okay between God and us? Is God okay with us? Or is there tension in that relationship? Is the relationship good and healthy or is it broken? If it's broken, we need to remember that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he came with the purpose of making things right. We also need to remember though that some of this is up to us. You may remember the angels announcing the Lord's birth and how they said glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. That's in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. And so the question then is, are we the ones with whom God is pleased? This peace on earth isn't for everybody. It's only for those with whom God is pleased. So peace is a gift, but it's absolutely a gift that needs to be received in order to be appreciated. He is the Prince of Peace. This morning then we studied the king with four names. I hope we've noticed that all four of these names can really truly only be associated with deity. These are the names of God, and certainly Jesus was and continues to be God. He's our wonderful counselor. As we mentioned earlier, the word wonderful is only used in Scripture to refer to God. He is wonderful. He is our advisor. And so the question, the application for us today is, are we going to him for advice? Are we listening to what he's saying? His word is perfect in every way. He is our mighty God. One chapter later in Isaiah 10, 21, this term is used to describe God himself. Do we understand that Jesus truly is mighty, that he has the power to fight our spiritual battles? Do we leave our worrying to God as we should? He's our eternal father. Only God himself is truly everlasting. According to Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's eternal. He's our father. And the question then is, do we trust that he's looking out for us as our father? Do we believe that Jesus cares for us, just like a good father cares for his children? And then finally, he is our prince of peace. He's the source of all peace for those with whom he's pleased. He is our peace, Paul will go on to write later. He has the power to restore relationships. When we sin, only he has the ability to truly make things right. And so do we believe that Jesus is the answer to sin and do we live like it? Those are questions for us to consider. And at the end of all of this, more than 700 years before it happens, notice down there at the end, Isaiah says that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And Isaiah is exactly right. Jesus comes into this world, he takes on flesh and he gives himself for us. He is the king with four names. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, according to Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Before we remember his sacrifice with the partaking of the Lord's Supper, let's close this part of our service by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. He is truly our wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. You are the one and only awesome God. And as our Father, you know exactly what we need before we even think to ask. We ask you though to watch over us as a congregation. As individuals, we pray that you would continue blessing us not only with resources, but also with opportunities to do good and to share. Because we know that with these sacrifices, you are pleased. We come to you in the name of Jesus, the name above all names. Lord, come quickly, amen.
morning. We're going to pray for the bread and the juice. Now, let's remember what we're uh, what we're doing, why we're here. Um, this is a uh, time for us to get our minds right, block out all the earthly things that are going on, and focus on on the sacrifices that Jesus made for us, so that we can be with Him and the Father in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that your son made, giving up his body. Bless this emblem of uh, his body, the bread, which represents his body. Help us be mindful of why we're taking it, the reasons behind it, and um, reflect on uh, where we need to be and, and how we need to get there. Thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. I will pray for the juice. Dear Lord, thank you for, again, the sacrifice of your son and his blood, which washed away our sins, being that perfect sacrifice, unlike the, the, the years before that, that they used animals to push it forward. This was a true forgiveness and a true washing of our sins. This emblem represents his blood, and we, we thank you for everything that he's done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.